We're ready. All right, so I'm going to talk about parasitology. Um, parasitology is basically taking a closer look at parasitic organisms. Um, I'm specifically going to talk about taking a closer look at nematodirus worms, which is a type of parasite. So what is a parasite? <laughs> a parasite is an organism that grows, feeds, and is sheltered on or in another type of organism while it's contributing absolutely nothing to the growth or the survival of its host. Sounds wicked to me. Yeah. Um, so there are two different types of parasites. There's an internal parasite and an external parasite. Nematodirus is an internal parasite. Okay, so I now, now see how this is going to work. I'm going to add. What's a more scientific name for uh, internal parasite? See how much we're learning? Endoparasite. And what's a name for an external parasite? Ectoparasite, E-C-T-O, parasite, one word. Ectoparasite versus endoparasite. See how I'm a team member? Yes. Um, so Nematodirus is classified as a roundworm that only affects ruminant animals. So for more of a clarification on ruminant animals, that means it's not gonna affect dogs, cats, or swine. Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it amazing some parasites live better in some animals than others? Do you know why? I mean, why not a dog? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not sure. Yeah, good point. It's kind of like heartworms with dogs. They get it, but people can't. Right? We can get bit by that mosquito that has the heartworm, but we don't get it. So, I mean, there's something. It's either pH, uh, hormone levels, who knows what it is. Anyway. Uh, so without proper management, uh, the life cycle of a parasite becomes a constant cycle. Uh, so I was going to explain a little bit the cycle of the nematodirus worm on how it lives and how it grows. So it starts inside the animal. It lives inside the small intestine. It thrives by getting nutrition from the animal's body. And then when, it become, when the worm becomes an adult, it lays an egg inside the small intestine. The eggs then get passed out through the feces of the animal, and then it's here on the grass um, in the manure. And uh, the eggs hatch in the larva, uh, and then they live on the grass or the ground area. They hatch more rapidly in wet weather, cool, wet environments, moist grass is where they thrive. And I think that's one thing with all parasites. Some environments are make them thrive, and some environments, some years are even different, mm -hmm. can maybe have a lower level of a certain parasite. It's true. Yes. And then rain comes and removes the manure, which leaves the larva up here on the grass blades, waiting for the animal to come and eat the parasite while it's grazing. So then once it's inside, back inside the small intestine, uh, the larva matures into an adult, which takes about three weeks. Then the adults lay more eggs, and the cycle starts all over again. The small intestine can be seriously damaged in a massive infection. So if the parasite is not controlled, the animal can become very unhealthy very quickly. So, um, yeah. Um, do you know like how they would prevent or you know if there's an infestation in your farm like how would you eliminate it from the grass? Um, well I'll talk about that a little bit later with prevention definitely but um, to answer your question right now um, having a protocol a prevention protocol in place is really important so like pasture maintenance cleaning the fecal regularly out of the pastures. Mm -hmm. Okay good question. Um, so nematodirus, some symptoms it can cause is diarrhea, dehydration, it can cause severe weight loss, and loss of appetite. If it's left untreated for a long period of time, it can eventually lead to death. So then diagnosis is based on those clinical signs that I just listed and detection of characteristics in the, of the eggs and the feces. 
So something I do on my farm back home is we do an in-house feces test uh, or fecal test. Kind of like a fecal party kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I throw jokes in here too, by the way. <laughs> um, so what that we process the fecal and then we're able to look at it under the microscope. So we have a microscope. Do you do any staining? We don't do stain. Yep. No, we just. Well, the reason I want to add that slides. is some people don't like to stain because it introduces artifacts. And you write that down. Artifacts. A R T I facts. Artifacts. And artifacts are something you see under the microscope in this case that isn't really there or wasn't there or wasn't in the sample or is misleading. An artifact. You've got to be careful of artifacts. So I like you do it in house. Um, do you randomly pick out fecal material or do you watch that sheep and then you go get her poop? Tell me. Well, so for large livestock animals, typically what you do is you put a glove on and you... Oh, a grab sample. <laughs> Got it. Okay, a grab sample. That's how we collect our fecals, uh, which is usually pretty different than companion animals. Yeah. <laughs> so these aren't my pictures. Um, there's a works cited page at the end of the presentation that takes credit for them. Um, but I have seen this under the microscopes. Um, so this picture right here on the left, these big eggs, these are going to be the nematodirus eggs. And then as you can see, they're surrounded by a lot of other parasitic eggs. So then this picture right here on the right is just an up-close image of the nematodirus cell, and they have very distinct characteristics. So they're very big, first off. So when you're comparing it to other cells, they're pretty easy to detect. They also have this double membrane, so it's easy to see down here at the bottom and up here on the top. And then the large developing larva mm -hmm. inside, so these big circles here. Yeah, and sometimes when you're looking at things under the microscope, you have to lower or uh, raise the objective to see different yeah. uh, areas of the membrane. Mm -hmm. So how we usually go about treatment then is we take an entire slide and it usually takes between 15 and 30 minutes to look at an infected slide to count each individual one we see. And if it's over a certain amount of number, uh, each farm does it differently. So it just depends on your farm or your veterinarian on that number. Um, what kind of treatment you're going to give. Um, which takes me to my next point. So this isn't something that you want swimming around inside your animal's body. So treatment is a very important thing. A common treatment that's used for uh, this internal parasite is a dewormer. Um, however, sometimes other actions are required, so it's always important to consult with your veterinarian before administering any kind of treatment. And I like that because, see, a veterinarian, here's their claim to fame, he or she. They get continuous education. If there's some contraindications for a certain uh, treatment, they tell you about it. They're up to date on all that. You're not, nobody, unless they're in that business, basically. Yeah, um, and, re and recent studies, actually, um, some Jeez, parasites... Where did you plan that? Now she's doing <laughs> the recent studies, see? Some parasites have developed a resistance to treatments or to some dewormers, so that impedes the effective treatment of the disease. Yep. Just exactly what I'm talking about. You gotta, yep. you gotta be up to date on this stuff. Something that worked last year may not work this year or there's something better. And depending on what you're gonna use, it depends on the environment, on the time of year, on what kind of parasite you're treating. Mm -hmm. So the ones listed up here are common ones, are just common dewormers. Right, and notice uh, in this class, we don't give out medical advice. Right. So, you know, none of us are, License to prescribe medicines in this room unless somebody is out here that I don't know of. I have a PhD degree, so I don't prescribe medicines. And by the way, I was just at a, I'll have to tell you the story. This weekend, I took some puppies to a veterinarian because we all need help. Are you done? No. Uh, I have a little bit to say on parasite management, and then I can finish up. So it's imperative to have a parasite management plan in action um, as a preventative to keep your animals in good health. Um, so these are my pets. This is my llama, Saxony, and this is her baby, Chiaria. So a couple years we had a um, parasite outbreak on our farm. 
So I know that sometimes it takes a big wake up call to put these preventative measures in action. So it's really important to have that step. So some things that I found that work are having good herd management. So um, having a good diet for your animal, making sure you're aware of the health of your animal, pasture management, rotating pastures helps keep the grass healthy and growing and being able to keep it clean by removing that manure and yep. soil management. Sometimes we get a lot of rain, which is really good for parasites, not so great for your animal. Yep. And rotating pasture is a very common technique uh, where you give the certain area a rest. And then animal density, the, usually the higher the density, the more parasites, because the more fecal material, more likely. There's a question for you over there. I know it probably varies between parasites, but um, do you know how long typically they will be able to survive in the grass or in the pasture? They can survive up to years as long as the right conditions are available for them, because they're just reproducing at a very <coughs> fast rate. So even if there was no animals in a pasture, you could come back a year later and probably find the parasite? Could you, on this one, maybe? I believe so. Okay, yeah. And then maybe if you find out something later, we could add something or whatever. Are you done now? Yes. Okay, other questions? Um, have you ever found like more than one kind of parasite and had to treat them in two different ways? Like, How would you go about doing that? Yeah, um, so actually, to answer that a little more specifically, this picture right here is showing the nematodirus cells, and then I believe these are strong guile cells, so that's another type of parasite. Um, that would be treated differently. So different dewormers are used to deworm different types of worms. Yeah, and, and in some cases, one dewormer might get two, but you know, yes. it's always, that's why you check with your veterinarian. That's, yeah, that's excellent. Are there any, <clears throat> sorry, are there any like precautions you have to take as far as like this dewormer counteracting this <clears throat> one, or do you not have to worry about? Something? Like an interaction you're talking yeah. about, or a toxicity. Sometimes you get two and there's a synergistic reaction be because of chemicals that makes them more powerful than two separately. That's a whole thing about toxicology. I don't know if you know any of that. If she's, you know, if you have two different uh, dewormers, let's say, are there going to be? Is there some precautions? I'm not sure. We usually try and take the precautionary route by using the one dewormer that is pretty universal, okay. so it's going to treat lots of things yeah, at like one time. Sometimes they call that broad spectrum. Okay. You know, like an antibiotic is broad spectrum that covers a lot of stuff. Cool. Oh, did you have, did you have a question? Oh, okay.